we've got a fairly rigorous methodology on this evaluation. Basically, we've got some key informants to talk to. We've got focus groups of beneficiaries and also some focus groups of the barangay, the local level village council. We have conducted a survey by a local research firm that has collected uh, considerable data on the benefits of these infrastructure projects, which will give us quantitative data to complement the qualitative data. I'm doing the cost efficiency part of uh, the evaluation, so um, to give them a firm basis of what's going on, how the money was spent specially, how effective the program is. So they want to quantify the impact, the cost, and whether the assistance has uh, been effective in a way of uh, giving the high return. We've had the advantage of looking at some very good studies done by the Inspector General, which gave us good background information. And other data sources, secondary data sources. We have observational data where we visited uh, all of the sites which we cite in our reports. So that is our basic strategy. It's a combination of qualitative data on the ground and quantitative data from whatever sources we can uh, find and uh, a process of triangulation. What's good with this evaluation now is that you have a very good pool, like Mary has been around in Mindanao. It's like an adopted, <laughs> adopted lady, adopted Mindanao. You have Jeanette, you have a very good pool who are very grounded of the Mindanao context. So that's one critical component. For instance, when we were in Datupaglas municipality, it is a Muslim community and at that time they were observing Ramadan. They were fasting and it was just right for us that we observe their own religious or Islamic beliefs. One of the most important insights that uh, we gained from uh, the development of the RFP is the need to include a specific focus and emphasis on preparatory activities prior to data collection. This is something that we included in the scope of work, but unfortunately it was not emphasized enough. And our concern was that uh, the team who would be winning the bid will have uh, enough uh, activities for preparations that they're able to hire a local person, for example, who would be very familiar with the area, has a network of contacts, has uh, knowledge of the terrain of the project sites, can speak the dialect, because that person can pave the way for the team, and that, uh, that person can help identify who the respondents are, set the appointments, and confirm the appointments for interviews, focus group discussions, way before the project team arrives in country. This is something that should be emphasized among all our partners because we, it's possible that if this is not done, a team could come into the country and have no one to interview. We have two teams out and in that way we're going to be able to cover all the program areas. I'm in team two and I have a counterpart in team one uh, where both the institutional development specialists and after all these field interviews, Ed and I will discuss our interview results from different uh, uh, provinces in Mindanao. We have a set of uh, key questions which we will all use, so it's, in a way it's, a, it's standard key questions. But you've really got to be nimble on your feet to try to put it in their own terms as best you can. And if one phraseology doesn't work, one phrasing doesn't work, then you come back with something simpler from another direction. You need to be selective on the type of information that you want to, to collect because not every tidbit of information needs to be collected for you to understand what is going on. In each case, we're going to try to capture a sense of how these various projects have have affected or impacted, if you will, the uh, conflict in this area. In this case, a grain dryer, where uh, how has it actually benefited economically a group of families that are probably using this grain dryer, or perhaps the entire community. We know that at the local level, there are stories behind the numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's not black or white. It's really, it's black 
but there's a there's a story behind why it's black or it's white and there's a story behind so sometimes it gets so frustrating when you're presented with project evaluation reports when the stories behind the numbers are not shared by story so because in real life you cannot simply measure it one plus one is equals two we're currently on our tour of the hatchery and Mary's taking this opportunity to interview our key informant that we're actually due to speak with later but uh, Mary thought this might be a good opportunity um, to put her more at ease, uh, you know, get her focused on describing what's going on and then Mary can ask probing questions and solicit the information that we're going to try to also capture during the key informant interview later. When the, the interaction between the interviewer and the interviewees are good, there's a tendency that you veer away from the main discussion topics, but it is okay because in the process, you are actually building rapport. You are actually building relationship along that process. And that is helpful because it opens up the door for the interviewees to become more open and provide you the right information. My component is dealing with former combatants. And so we spent a lot of time preparing before we went out in the field and really fine tuning our questions. The interview that's worked best so far, uh, what made this particular case uh, successful, I think the, the first item was that we didn't meet in the Barangay Hall. We met out in their community and it was a more informal setting, which naturally they started off more at ease. Um, I also think that our uh, sequencing of questions that we asked first about the cooperative as a whole and then focused in more on them as former combatants helped put them at ease at the beginning and then we got more specific and we're able to you know, dig into to greater detail. And then third, we were a smaller group. Um, on some of our interviews, representatives from the municipal government have joined us. But in this case, it was just my, my fellow interviewer and I and, and then our translator. And again, I think that really put him at ease and, and gave more forthright answers. When we were at um, Bato Bato in Tawitawi, we met with the focus groups and uh, you notice that after a few minutes I took the mayor out of the room and asked him to show me the boat landing and the pathway. There were two reasons for this one is um, I also wanted to talk to the mayor just to get his views on the project but the other reason is also to get him away from the focus group so that they would feel free to talk to the interviewers um, rather than always being conscious that the mayor is there. So this is in a way um, trying to reduce the elite capture of information. And I had a very good discussion with the mayor too on his plans for his municipality. And also working through a translator. Um, you spend a lot of time carefully formulating your questions and then in larger groups that don't necessarily understand uh, your phrasing that you have to use a translator you have a tendency to almost oversimplify the question. So you just have to work your way around that, see what kind of information you get back, maybe take a less direct path. Also when the interview or a focus group discussion is quite a big group, in most instances the participants are a bit shy to participate. And if there are foreigners or expats leading the discussion, there's a tendency that the interviewees may not get the questions right, so they may not be answering in the right direction. For instance, when they were asked about what improvements they would like to introduce if they are given the chance to do the project again, they are actually answering in different direction. But when some members of the evaluators left and those who were left are already talking in vernacular in the local dialect, then that was the time that they were a bit open. They talk a lot and we get a lot of information from them. You have to, in a sense, innovative in, uh, of capturing uh, the benefits and the cost. Because for each particular type of uh, assistance or project, you know, the benefits and cost could be you know, totally different. Let's say, for example, the bridge. So the benefits could include easy access or easy mobility of people and uh, vehicles. But for another type of bridge, let's say a uh, footbridge, the benefits could include only access of people but not necessarily the vehicles. It could also include costs, no? uh, access or easy access of uh, uh, 
the criminal groups or the rebel groups because if you have this bridge or boat landing, they can use that. You, you observe the difference in the reply of the interviewees. You know, they, they, they answer the same question in different yeah, manners. And the, uh, and their approach of answering is all different. There's also some bias. It depends on the uh, individual's uh, outlook, maybe. It is a little difficult to get facts as such from respondents. Uh, one has to really come back several times uh, with different respondents with even the same question to see from a different angle the truth behind their responses. Well, let's capture that today. You want you, you want a mid kind of a, a midway point where you say, okay, let's stop and just catch our breath and see where we are. Every time we ask about gender involvement, Notwithstanding they have a gender plan, everyone kind of laughs and says, women do not do manual labor. That's a consistent response. Uh, they do cooking. That's it. We may begin to see more of it in your BSO, maybe on workforce. I think it's important to look at the community because some communities are already conflict-free because the LGUs have already done something <coughs> on their own. So, you know, the GEM project may just um, be an addition, but it probably is not the, the reason for the reduction in conflict. We're seeing a lot of projects in the conflict areas, some of which we can't go to because of the, because of the uh, potential violence or the uh, firefights that are taking place. Uh, but it still begs the question of, do we do a lot of things all over? or should we have one grandiose project which is targeted in mass into an area? It's good I still have this um, battery charge in my laptop and I, I was able to finish and save my work or else it would be a big problem. I will start all over again. And until now, after 12 hours, uh, there's still no power and uh, actually we're perspiring a, a bit. I'm, I just said, Ima, we have made some adjustments to our sites based on discussions with the team, the drivers, USAID and GEM Security Advisory. We have decided to exclude Aliosan, Kamen, Matalam and Pickett in North Cotabato. We will include Libungan and Pigawayan. Let us know if you have comments and views about the new municipalities. So, anything else to add? That's about. So I'll send it now. Oh, no signal. We're heading to the Muslim Kutawato Chamber of Commerce, but unfortunately, the interviewee is still sleeping, so at the moment, the activity is cancelled. Yeah, the fuse box was already burned, this one. The old terminal are burning, and then we re replace a new. This is our reserve. I think it cannot be fixed in a couple of minutes, so another uh, vehicle from the nearby municipality is uh, picking us up so that we could proceed to Cotabato. Despite the fact that we've had uh, quite unusual weather, uh, we've had a typhoon, we've had mass flooding, we've had an earthquake, uh, we've more or less been able to get around to the communities that we needed to uh, and meet the people that we needed to interview. Um, however, there were a few instances where we had to, to think on our feet 